and welcome to today's lecture on Ancient Greek History. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to look at a society that lasted more than 2,000 years. At least if you look at it in a particular way. Look at it another way, and the Golden Age of Greece was only 50 years long. But the influence of Greece undoubtedly has lasted more than two millennia, right? We still use classical forms of architecture, we still put on plays and theaters, and we still vote in something we call a democracy. So whether you want to defeat the Persians in battle, or simply want to debate the meaning of life with Socrates, journey with me as we investigate ancient Greek history. The history of ancient Greece is something distinctive, different from what's happening in the Near East or in Northern or Western Europe. All begins in the Bronze Age. In this part of the world, the Bronze Age generally began around 3000 BCE, about 5000 years ago. And this is the period of time where cultural groups move from relative equality and homogeneity to complexity and hierarchy. In a way, you could think of this period as the rise of civilization. Although Greece was a relatively slow starter compared to the early empires of Mesopotamia and the powerful state of ancient Egypt. Right around the same time Khufu is building the Great Pyramid at Giza, the largest structure in Greece is simply a large house. And while their Cycladic sculptures of the early Bronze Age have an aesthetic sophistication, they pale in comparison to the monumental statues of Old Kingdom Egypt. So Greece, it turns out, is a really slow starter compared to the empires of the ancient Near East and Egypt. But starting in the second millennium BC, uh, things really pick up, both with monumental architecture and sophisticated art to rival anything that's going on in the Near East. Two major civilizations arise during the Greek Bronze Age. The Minoans on the island of Crete and the Mycenaeans on the Greek mainland. Both of these civilizations are centered on enormous palaces. The Minoan Palace of Pnossus, with its complicated design and frequent bull imagery, may serve as the inspiration for the Minotaur's labyrinth. The Mycenaean Palace at Mycenae was the legendary home of King Agamemnon, and the seat of power for one of the strongest city-states in the Aegean Bronze Age world. So what can these palaces tell us about the way that life actually was? Well, it turns out it can tell us a lot about the ancient economy. And in particular, it tells us that they likely had a redistributive economy, meaning that people would send their goods to the palace, and then the palace would redistribute those goods back to the people. And what this allows for is specialization. So if your land is best for olive growing, grow all olives. And if your land's best for grain growing, grow grain. And then you submit that to the, uh, to the palace, and then they give you a diversity of things in return. And this idea of a redistributive economy, this is also supported in the, uh, the textual material we have. So we have these burnt clay tablets with a syllabic script known as Linear B. And it's all about accounting, right? Different things that ship, get shipped to the palace and different things that should go out to other areas. One final thing that's really interesting about these palaces, both on Minoan Crete and on mainland Mycenaean Greece, is that we get a really big difference in terms of how they're protected. So the Mycenaeans have these massive walls known as Cyclopean walls. The, uh, the Minoans, on the other hand, well, they don't have any walls at all, which is absolutely bonkers for any Bronze Age civilization. After nearly a millennium of flourishing, the massive Minoan and Mycenaean palaces were eventually destroyed around 1200 BCE. And the destruction didn't end there. Right around this time, between 1200 and 1100 BCE, we see the destruction of massive Bronze Age sites and cultures all across the Mediterranean and the Near East. Mighty Troy Falls, 
the Hittite capital of Hattusa is burned, and even the Egyptians are under invasion, eventually repelling their assailants, but plunging into a period of chaos nonetheless. So we generally call this time, which lasts about a century, the uh, collapse of the Bronze Age, since it was so widespread geographically, and yet so tight-knit uh, in terms of chronology. And we see this happen all over the place. The Egyptians chalk it up to something they call the Sea Peoples, this kind of diverse group of naval marauders. But modern scholars think it was probably a much more complex, diverse set of causes, everything from kind of famine and environmental collapse to internal rebellion to external invasion. After the collapse of the Bronze Age, the entire area around the Aegean plunged into what is commonly known as the Greek Dark Ages. These are marked by a decline in sophistication and complexity and scale in nearly all facets of culture. The palaces disappear, settlements get smaller in size and less frequent, burials become poorer, art becomes geometric, losing all forms of human and animal iconography, and to cap it all off, even writing disappears. They forget how to write for 400 years. And this makes total sense if you think about the purpose of writing, right? If the reason you're writing is to uh, record goods that are coming into a palace and then where to send those goods afterwards, well, when there's no more palace and there's no more redistributive economy, there's no real need for writing in the first place. Regardless, it seems like the, uh, the Dark Ages were really a, reduce, a time of reduced complexity for a large swath of the ancient Aegean. Around 800 BCE, Greece starts to emerge from the Dark Ages. Populations grow, eventually to the point where cities become overpopulated. And when that happens, the Greeks set sail across the Mediterranean, founding colonies in Sicily, southern Italy, France, Spain, and even the Black Sea. This period of colonization spreads Greek culture far and wide, and part of that culture is emerging right at that time. In fact, most of the things we consider quintessentially Greek are born during this period, which we know as the Archaic. So things like Greek pottery and Greek temples and the Olympics and even democracy, these are all started during the Archaic period in Greece. One of the major developments right around 800 BCE is the reinvention of writing. And this time it's totally different. Rather than a syllabic script requiring hundreds or thousands of symbols, the new alphabet is borrowed from the Phoenicians and contains just 24 letters. And with these letters, you can recreate just about any sound or word in the ancient Greek language. So when writing reemerges, they start using it for things like epic poems about the heroes of Greek mythology, rather than just accounting records. Moreover, this technology allows people to record their ideas, so when they die, their ideas live on. We also get the development of democracy at the very end of the Archaic period, right around 500 BCE. And this happens in Athens during a time of chaos, when Athens is under threat from Sparta. And Athenian democracy, it turns out, looks very, very different than democracy in the United States today. Whereas we vote on representatives, who then go ahead and make the laws, the ancient Greeks voted on everything, right? So in an Athenian democracy, if you were a free male citizen, you would vote on taxes, or whether to go to war, or whether, whether to exile somebody. Everybody voted on every issue. But even with all the developments of the Archaic period, Greece was still in a dangerous place. They'd caught the eye of the mighty Persian Empire, and not in a good way. In 490 BCE, Persia sailed across the Aegean to attack Athens. But in one of the great military upsets in history, 9,000 Athenians repelled more than 30,000 Persians at the Battle of Marathon. Ten years later, Persia returned this time with nearly half a million troops. And after slaying the brave Spartans at Thermopylae, they burned the city of Athens. But the Athenians got the last laugh. 
and after tricking the Persians into a naval battle at the Straits of Salamis, they destroyed the Persian navy and its supply lines, crippling the land-based army and securing victory for the puny Greeks over the greatest empire the world had ever seen. And this was a huge, unexpected win for the Greeks. And it ushers in what we call the Classical Period, which runs from around 480 BCE to 323 BCE with the death of Alexander the Great. And during this time, Athens becomes fabulously wealthy, even to the point where some people would consider that Athens is moving from a city-state to being the capital of an Athenian empire. While we usually associate the idea of empire with something bad, the Athenians were able to create quite the lasting legacy in just a short time. They perfect Greek religious architecture with the Parthenon on the Athenian Acropolis. Vase painting reached its pinnacle in the 6th and 5th centuries BCE. Philosophers questioned who we are, how we should behave, and why the world works the way it does. And all this time, Athenian citizens had the power to vote and determine their own fate. But this all came crashing down within a century of the Greek victory over the Persians. So the city-state of Sparta, scared of this rising Athenian power, lays siege to the city of Athens. And in a 27-year-long war known as the Peloponnesian War, Athens and Sparta go to battle. And eventually it's Sparta who gets the upper hand, defeats the Athenians, and reduces their empire to shambles. Now, on the one hand, this is good. It restores balance in ancient Greece. On the other hand, it brings the Golden Age to a close. One of the effects of the Peloponnesian War and the succeeding wars of the 4th century BCE is that the outer regions of Greece became more and more drawn into Greek life, militarily, politically, and economically. One of the main regions to experience this was Macedon, whose people fought as allies and mercenaries during the preceding wars. By the second half of the 4th century BCE, Macedon, under the leadership of its king Philip II, eventually became the leading power of Greece after defeating Athens and Thebes at the Battle of Chironea. Now Philip had plans to march on the Persian Empire. He just had to do one more thing before that happened. He had to secure a marriage alliance to make sure that all of Greece would be placated. But at his wedding, he's assassinated, he's stabbed in the back. And young Alexander, just a teenager at the time, quickly has to take control of the army, quell any rebellion. And once he does this, now he sets his sights on the Persian Empire. At this time, Persia was still the largest empire in the world. But Alexander was no ordinary leader. He was consistently at the head of his army, charging headlong into battle, and often straight at the opponent's foremost general. In a few short years, Alexander had defeated the Persian leader, Darius III, making him beg for surrender, then chasing him down and killing him. Along the way, he portrayed himself as a new Achilles, had himself proclaimed Lord of Asia, and even declared that an oracle said he was a god. But eventually, after making it as far as India, his troops were ready to mutiny. And as he marched back to Greece, Alexander drank himself to death. And so on his deathbed, Alexander's generals come to him and they say, Alexander, you, you built the greatest empire the world has ever seen. Who's gonna take over when you're gone, when you die? And he looks to them in his sick little voice, he says, I leave it to the strongest. And this, of course, causes all sorts of problems. Alexander's generals scatter and they take parts of their army with them. And they carve out different regions of the empire. And we call this period the Hellenistic world because it's this Greek leadership then kind of melding with local cultures over different parts of both Eastern Europe and uh, Western Asia. And during the next 300 years, during the Hellenistic period, these generals and their descendants fight with one another, trying to regain the empire Alexander once had, but never succeeding in doing so. And then when Rome comes in from the West, Rome starts, off, uh, starts picking off those empires one by one until it has the new greatest empire the world has ever seen. Now, 
Now, one of the reasons to study ancient Greece is because it's one of the few places in deep antiquity where power gets dispersed to the people instead of having one ultra-powerful king rule everything. And this dispersal of power leads to all sorts of other awesome developments, right? Drama and literature and uh, art and architecture, philosophy. And so if you want to build a great society, take everyone's voices and views into account. Just a few lessons you can learn from. Ancient Greek history.